Hello, welcome. This is going to be my little lecture on Rudolf Carnap's Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology. I really recently read it for class. I thought it was interesting. I wanted to give my thoughts on it for anybody new to the piece. Um, and a general introduction to it, if you want to hear more, there's a lot to say about this article. So let's just jump in. I think the main contention is trying to get at how to remedy, quote, abstract entities, Carnap calls them, that the word, with empiricism. So let's explain both these. Abstract entities, he means, and he kind of explains this within the work, properties, classes, numbers, relations, and he even, even gives more. Um, and think numbers, so whenever we think of this as an abstract entity, we don't think of numbers as something like there's a five out there in the world. We see maybe five sticks, five trees, five stones, five cats. And that's how we get five, but then that's kind of more of a class thing. And how do we group this together? How do we know that what's that unifying five? The empiricist doesn't quite know what to say because the empiricism is the theory of knowledge that ultimately knowledge comes from experience and observation. Now, he wants to illustrate that empiricism has a problem with this because we really do want to accept abstract entities. They're actually incredibly useful for things like math and physics, incredibly useful and instrumental goods in society. Um, and he says math, try to, people try to get away with just claiming as a mere calculus, a mere system of formal rules that we set up and kind of use to say, hey, we set up these rules, here's a game, it's kind of like chess, where we set up the, the rules of chess and then it's almost like every variation of the pieces has already kind of been seen and explained through the rules. Um, physics is a little different. Physics tries to make predictive claims. It tries to say that not just now, but maybe forever, as the universal laws put it, things will be in such and such way right? The electromagnetic waves or, or gravity, right? These are laws, universal laws at that. And so really abstract entities, he's talking about the problem of universals. Now, he's highlighted that empiricism wants abstract entities, but he doesn't actually know how to solve that problem. So he introduces a new way to think about it, frameworks. Now, within frameworks, a framework's the kind of scaffolding or schema we use to understand the world. And there's internal and external questions. Internal are within the framework. External are about the framework. So an internal question is something like, is there a paper on my desk? That's an internal question. Because it's, it's taking for granted certain assumptions like that we can know what a paper is, what the property of desk is, think the relations they're in, such as spatio-temporally, things like that. Are numbers real? is more of an external question. It's about the framework of numbers. And it's a little tricky. So he wants to approach the question and say, well, in what sense? Because he's saying, if, is, if you're asking, is the system of numbers empty? He's already kind of demonstrated that it is not. It is full. He says in the work on page 24 of the JSTOR edition, there is an n such that n is a number, or he put it earlier, there are numbers. This statement follows from the analytic statement, five is a number and is therefore itself analytic. Analytic meaning logically true in contrast to being maybe empirically true, um, but still true all the same. Uh, moreover, it is rather trivial in contradiction to the statement like, quote, there is a prime number greater than a million, end quote, which is likewise analytic, but far from trivial. And he goes on to say more than this. And indeed, if we were to ask them, the inquiries about whether or not our numbers real. Do you mean the question as to whether the system of numbers, if we were to accept it, would be found to be empty or not? They would probably reply, not at all. We mean the question prior to the acceptance of the framework. And Carnap calls it an ontological question. They're talking about the ontological status of numbers. And what Carnap's going to say is this question is ultimately a bad question. Um, whenever we adopt these frameworks, it's not a question of yes or no as to whether or not numbers are real or the property of desk is real. What we're really asking is what is the purpose of language? And when we ask that question, we realize it's about expression. And when we realize it's about expression, it's about matter of degree. So the ordinary, Carnap calls it thing language, explains the world of things. Right? And we take it for granted and we assume it because it's highly effective in everyday usage. Now, what Carnap's ultimate claim is, 
to kind of end and round out this paper is that it is not an ontological question of the status of numbers, but rather a practical one of adopting new linguistic forms. Now, that's a little complicated. So what we're trying to get is, it's not an ontological question, not a question of are numbers real in some metaphysical sort of sense. It's rather a practical one of whether or not it provides something like economy of expression, explanatory fruitfulness, pedagogical usefulness, uh, predictive power, etc. These are ways that my professor, Professor Dr. Bauer, put it. That's kind of the general framework that Rudolf Carnap uses in this article, Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology. Um, this was a really rough, quick go through, but I do want to end it on one quote, which I think is very poetic, um, that I think a lot of people think they wouldn't find in what is typically labeled as analytic philosophy. Um, he puts it as, let us grant to those who work in any special field of investigation the freedom to use any form of expression which seems useful to them. The work in the field will sooner or later lead to the elimination of those forms which have no useful function. And in italics, let us be cautious in making assertions and critical in examining them, but tolerant in permitting linguistic forms. Thank you for watching this video. And if you want to see more of these, let me know. There's a lot more to say about this article. This is really a, a rough, quick and dirty go through of it. But thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next one.